literature review, environmental scan, interviews, um, also some site visits of recycling, um, CRD or construction renovation and demolition waste recycling facilities, and then like transfer stations, like going to the landfill. So it smelt wonderful. Uh, so yeah, 30 plus interviews, uh, a lot of different uh, smarter people than me commenting on uh, the state of the system, what could be better, what's working now, what's not working. Surprise, surprise, a lot of it isn't working. Um, so that's the entire map. It's over there as well. Um, when it's really big like that, you really see the imperfections, but that's only to my eye. I'm sure it looks wonderful to yours. Um, so we'll break it down a little bit here just as, to get into some of the context. Um, so here, uh, global consumption in raw materials is set to nearly double by 2060. And we know about 37% of global carbon emissions come from um, buildings and the construction sector. So it's a huge number. Um, <clears throat> In Canada, uh, about 3.4 million tons of CRD, that's the construction, renovation, and demolition. So I'm going to be shortening that to CRD. Uh, is sent annually to landfill, and only about 16% is recycled. And research has shown that that number can basically be reversed with existing infrastructure today. More or less, you could you know, be recycling 75 to 80% of a building. Uh, and then in Ontario, many people don't know, but we're running out of landfill space. So in the next 10 years or plus, um, we're going to no longer have capacity. Um, depends on exports to the U.S. And it takes about 10 years to build a new landfill. So you can pretty much do the math there and realize we're um, heading towards trouble. Um, so wrong button. Sorry about that. Um yeah, so this here is just a little bit to break out uh, and explain the very aspects of the circular uh, ecosystem, looking at both kind of maturity and impact. This is sort of my own rough kind of mapping, but basically, just to give you a kind of high level understanding of the different facets that would be included in that would be first down in green is like CRD waste diversion. That's at the bottom. So that's just getting materials out of the landfill and into recycling, uh, you know, crushing up the concrete and reusing it and like that kind of a thing. So getting it away from the landfill. Uh, so, and in Guelph, Wellington, for instance, there's, you can recycle your asphalt uh, or sorry, your shingles, your wood, your concrete, your metal, your shingles. There are opportunities, just people don't really take advantage of them. And that's what we'll get into a little bit today. Uh, so in purple, you have source separation and deconstruction. So that's like, instead of just knocking a building down, you are actually taking the building apart and separating the screws from the wood and separating source separation, separating on site, and then uh, you know shipping it to recycling facilities or other options, which we'll also get into. Uh, so then next we have rec recycled and reclaimed materials. So reclaimed, you're just, you know, reusing that two by four versus recycle. You'll have like, you know, ground up concrete that gets turned into asphalt and it has a certain percentage of recycled material in it. Uh, so then building use and operation that, you know, extending the life of building, you know, the greenest building is the one we don't knock down. And then building design. So this is stuff like designing for disassembly. So you can actually take it apart easily and track the materials. Uh, and then as well, design for durability. So it lasts longer. You know, we make things that fall apart and we throw them out. So let's just make them last longer. Crazy idea. All right. Um, next, this is just a little bit looking at the different types of materials in the waste stream. Metals at the top of the pyramid because it is pretty much diverted along all chains of the waste stream from, you know, the construction to the renovation, demolition, to the hauling, to the transfer stations, to the landfill. It's got an economic return. So people pull it to make money. You know, it's a big shocker. People make money. So let's just make things actually cost what they're worth. Uh, cardboard as well, just because it's, you know, also gets a return on investment. And then Concrete, drywall, wood, and then shingles as well are, uh, there's a lot of it in the system and there are options for recycling, but the economics don't really work out. So generally they, they, that's where some of the biggest opportunity lies. All right. So why don't we build circular? This is a 
iceberg map, which is actually in this design shaped like a giant pile of waste. Um, and it breaks down looking at the trends and causes, the paradigms and the metaphors that underpin the existing system. Today, I'm just going to be talking about um, the causes and trends, because we could probably have a whole hour long discussion around the paradigms that underpin our current system. But uh, let's keep it strictly on what we can you know, affect at least, or what, what sort of is obvious in the, in the immediate. So trends for change, uh, climate change, it's driving a lot of change in the system today. You know, we see it on the resilience side with the impact on supply chains when we have extreme weather events. Um, we also see a uh, growing sophistication in the policy community and of change occurring. I know it's not fast enough or deep enough, but there is a lot of thought and process being put into that. And so that is pushing, uh, you know, decision makers forward. Um, and you also see uh, an increase around embodied carbon. So operational carbons, like the, the gas we use to heat our homes and embodied carbon is like, how much carbon is in like the thing that got made and like where it came from and shipping and transportation materials. And so increasingly that's the conversation, at least in the built environment, which would introduce an opportunity for dis more discussion around circularity. Because uh, when you start talking about, you know, the embodied, that's when, you know, you can reduce the, the carbon by, by reusing things or extending the life of things. Um, <clears throat> So um, trends that are kind of keeping the status quo in place. I mean, there's a housing crisis. So, you know, we've been expanding sprawl rather than urbanizing and densifying to a level that really we need, which is kind of locking in an unsustainable model of development. Um, and homes are now unaffordable for people. Um, so at the same time, the industry has to build more. They're facing a, a, a structural laborer uh, crisis, you know, people have just are aging out and not new people are not joining. Um, so this also then the industry uses this as a leverage saying we can't have new environmental regulations. And it's very obvious in their um, lobbying documents because it increases the cost to build. Um, you know, I think people in the high performance industry, I also work with Passive House Canada, would point to uh, tons of studies showing the opposite of that, but that's a whole other conversation, which we won't get into today. Uh, other kind of uh, trends that are keeping the system in check is there's limited um, data on materials. We don't really know what's going in and we really don't know what's going out. So it's hard to design any type of system when you have no idea what you're doing. Uh, there are limited subsidies, regulations, and standards on end of life. You know, you talk to engineers, um, they love a good standard. And if there isn't really that kind of uh, understood processes and systems and case studies that's rooted in it, then it's sort of like, yeah, it's a great idea, but it's not going to happen. Um, <clears throat> and then something else we'll talk a little bit later on is there's just no really built up salvage or resale market, which makes it uh, difficult for accessing reclaimed uh, materials to reuse in buildings. Uh, so causes for change. Um, Again, growing climate concern among the public, governments, and business. You also see this um, uh, in the private sector. There's uh, incre increasing field of pressure from institutional investors to incorporate climate risk into their business planning. Uh, again, it's slow, but there is quite a significant change that's occurred and is occurring. Um, another cause is to help drive the change is technological change in the construction industry is actually one, one that's been traditionally a real laggard. There's a huge amount of investment in innovation and, and con tech, as they refer to it, construction technology, which sounds weird when I say it out loud. Um, and so there's, again, opportunity for change with increased technological sophistication. You can start to implement some of more of this interesting things in the circular economy to track materials and you know be more thoughtful with um, the materials you use and their life cycle and, and those kinds of things. Um, so, oh, that was supposed to be cut out. So next, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, what we heard from stakeholders and the research around uh, the issues around regulation. Um, so this is like the big systems map, uh, mapping all the various players in the regulatory and economic, and then also how waste kind of moves through the system. Um, 
So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the province here. They set the planning framework and uh, the provincial policy statement, um, which is, you know, governs how things are organized around planning. And then they also set growth plans in the building code and then the waste framework through the Provincial uh, Environmental Protection Act and the Environmental Assessment Act. And, um, you know, it's clear that provincial leadership would have the biggest impact on the system wide. Uh, landfill bans on materials, making producers more responsible for their materials, um, separation and diversion requirements for uh, developments. Um, a few areas where the current system we heard from stakeholders was that like they have to get environmental compliance approval for any new type of recycling um, setup that they want to do, which is a long and complex process with huge assurance. So, so they got to put up money behind it. So you know, one veteran said it's a nightmare. The upfront cost is so high, it dissuades risk takers and innovation. You know, it's one of those things where you need innovation and you need risk taking, but at the same time, uh, you don't want a lot of risk and in innovation or risk in something that can cause massive pollution for those people who are next door to it. So um, it's, it's definitely not a clear cut. Also in Ontario, there's actually a law from the 90s from the Ray government on the books that requires large um, institutional, uh, commercial, and industrial projects to source separate their materials and uh, divert them. Uh, sorry, source separate them. There's no requirement for them to divert it. So basically, it's like they can separate it, but then they can just send it all to landfill and nobody really cares. Uh, and then on top of that, the uh, the Auditor General found that they have never inspected any demolition sites for following this rule. So basically, the regulator is asleep at the wheel. Um, another small thing, this is getting really in the weeds, because this really conversation was for, um, this my, this previous presentation was really for um, regulatory nerds. So any regulatory nerds out there, woo! Uh, there's one, so this one's for you. So. Uh, in the previous building code, they set up an alternative solutions framework. So for people who want to do something different with materials, uh, it's great. So they set up a process, except the municipalities are the one that run it and they run it on a cost recovery basis. So if you're an innovator and you want to do something different, you need your material to be certified, you're going to have to pay out of pocket for that process. So it's just another way that costs get increased. Uh, so then we get to municipalities uh, and, you know, this was a project for Guelph Wellington. So it was really geared towards what they can do. Uh, and they have a lot of frontline interaction with the development industry. They, you know, municipal permits for demolition or new build site plan control is like what the development looks like. And, you know, make sure that you, um, you know, do what we want on a number of different standards from shade to height to, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, zoning, what types of uh, buildings go where, um, and then fees, taxes, um, heritage, roads, like there's a lot of opportunity for them to do something a little different. Um, so some examples of municipalities that are doing something a little different, like the city of Richmond in BC, they piloted the use of recycled asphalt against the kind of overcoming skepticism of the engineers and the consultants and and in the end, they were like, oh, this is great. It works fine. You know, once they got the data and they started to see it in play, they realized that it was totally reasonable and feasible. Um, West Coast cities, uh, you know, Portland, um, Vancouver, Victoria, West Vancouver, North Vancouver, none of them all have enacted demo, uh, deconstruction bylaws where you have to deconstruct buildings of a certain age. And this uh, then has helped increase the kind of circular economy ecosystem around this deconstruction requirement. More can be done, but it's a start. Uh, and the Toronto Green Standard here for new buildings, city-owned buildings, which will be the norm for 2028, there will be circular criteria, uh, minimum 75% diversion of construction waste. So this again gets back to that instead of what we do 16% now, flipping that number to what is possible. Uh, and 30% reuse of structural elements. Um, so that could be really exciting if it continues. Um, so I also looked at what, in the city of Guelph, where the waste goes, uh, where, or where the recycled CRD materials go. And um, 
Uh, yeah, no, sorry, let's adding economic value. Okay. So, and I'll just talk about it. So uh, basically, um, you know, they have opportunities for wood and drywall and all these things, uh, but a lot of it just ends up uh, as being burnt into a, for greenhouses. So the material gets chopped up or it gets used as landfill cover. So the joke kind of is, I mean, it's like waste management joke. So I don't think it's that funny, but uh, the, there you go. The CRD material, it either ends up on top of the landfill or inside the landfill, but either way, it's still going to end up in the landfill. So even though we are recycling it, it's being downcycled. It's not being like reused for in new buildings or, um, you know, even asphalt uh, for, for roads or using the wood for yeah, structural purposes, not just like cool reclaimed coffee tables, like building buildings again with materials that we have taken out of other buildings is the goal. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, you know, at the same time, we did talk to a number of innovators who are working across um, Canada who are doing interesting things. And if there were regulatory changes, see an opportunity to open up in Ontario. Uh, and so we're not too far away. And with a little bit of thoughtful policy, we could really start to reverse some of this uh, waste that's really not uh, really low hanging fruit. Um, Ontario is one of the lowest cost jurisdictions for um, landfilling, so it's really cheap to just throw everything away, but partly because we're next to the United States, which has even lower costs to uh, throw things out. So you can go with a commercial load for like $14 a ton in Michigan and, and dump whatever you want. And if your gas is cheap, then you know that's a way to save money. And so we send about 30% of our waste to the U.S. currently, uh, and that's that's why. Um, yeah, so yeah, I skipped over a bunch, but that's fine. Um, I also looked kind of at a uh, behavior that underpins the existing system. Uh, and it's pretty obvious to see that like high oil prices reduces the impact of climate change, less burning of oil, uh, less climate change. And then also the high oil prices increases the cost to send materials to landfill and increases the cost to extract natural resources to pull them out of the you know deep hinterlands. Um, and access to uh, landfills to dump most materials makes mechanical demolition um, and harvesting of virgin materials the low cost option. Um, but we uh, we also know on the you know reclaimed materials market side. Deconstruction is just a sliver of the market. Uh, you know, we, we spoke with one uh, deconstruction company in Waterloo that doesn't even work on residential projects because they find it is just not economic. Um, they work on some larger projects, um, but it's, it's just a real sliver of the market. There's a little bit of deconstruction done around um, the, um, you know, Habitat for Humanity will come and take uh, a kitchen out or cabinets and, and resell it through the re restore. But that's really done not for any economic gain or for the tax receipt. It's really just an ad hoc process that's driven by people's desire not to throw out perfectly good things. And so we can't really design a system um, based on values as much as I'd love to. Um, you know, it's got to make economic sense because that's the system we get. Um, <clears throat> So back to our reclaimed market, um, you also have a lack of infrastructure and regulatory hurdles that increase costs, like I talked about our uh, alternative solutions market. There's absence of support of government policies. You know, when you look at the gov federal government's green building strategy, it, you know, waste and circularity is mentioned once, whereas, you know, uh, net zero and resilience is, you know, 50 times each. So it's just not as prominent in the conversation. Uh, and then since the market is underdeveloped, it's mainly boutique builders using reclaimed or recycled materials in expensive custom projects and result, the majority of materials end up in landfill. Uh, one other thing, we just looked at the city of Guelph and they put a fee to increase uh, the quality of materials, uh, a contamination fee. So if your materials are contaminated, you're going to pay an extra fee. Well, that just sent everybody else to private transfer stations and they started to collect less material. So 
uh, rather than achieving what they wanted, uh, they just actually received fewer materials in the end. So there are lots of opportunities because there are lots of problems. I didn't really get into all of that in this presentation because um, uh, this was a more of a deeper analysis into the current